let's go to God's word and hear the way that it was officially written down by John, the gospel writer, how he officially recorded the story that I told seated on the steps. And we're reading from John 6, verses 1 to 14. And uh, before that, let's pray so that God will illuminate this word for us. Dear God, our provider, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry today for the heavenly food that you have prepared for us. And by your Holy Spirit, nourish us in our faith. And make us ever ready to follow the one who came to love us and show us the way. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and he sat down there with his disciples. Now, the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. And when he looked up and saw a large crowd coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him. For he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, six months wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now, there was a great deal of grass in that place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he'd given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up. And from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Imagine this. You go into the countryside to see a traveling preacher. The way he shares the word of God, it's like you've never heard it before. And he's a healer too. They tell the story often that one time there was a woman and all she did was touch the cloak of his robe and suddenly she was healed from an illness of several years, a terrible illness, suddenly. Imagine it's warm outside. It's Passover. It's springtime. The grass is green. The flowers are coming out. You can just smell the warm, wonderful day in the air. It's a perfect day to be outside. And when you get there to the countryside, you realize everyone had the same idea. They're all there too. But no one brought anything to eat. They must have been in a hurry. Or maybe they were just traveling light. Or maybe they just thought their wife had it in her backpack. Or the husband in his. And they just left it behind. And so imagine this, there's a big surprise, kind of like when you came in the church this morning and you saw picnic tables instead of pews. And I heard some of you going, oh, oh my, like something strange might happen. But there on the hillside, something strange did happen. Jesus took these five barley loaves, and by the way, barley loaves are like smaller than personal pizza. We're talking barley loaves are like a... a, a personal little pita that you would eat. And barley was the food of peasants. So it was the food everybody could have, that kind of flour. So five of those little loaves, and two fishes, and suddenly there's a huge feast. Suddenly there's a feast for 5,000 people. And when the Bible says 5,000, it's counting men. And so we're thinking maybe 10,000, maybe more people. They're eating their local foods that they all love. Fresh baked bread and savory fish, probably dried or pickled. Yum! When I told the preschool children about the fish, they were not so excited. 
I like fish, so I'm excited about this picnic. Now, everyone feels satisfied, and they all have plenty to eat, all five to 10,000 of them. And can you imagine being welcomed and blessed and served by Jesus? Can you imagine that? And it costs you nothing but being present and being ready to share. So later, the whole world hears about your famous picnic. Everybody hears. It gets written down in the Bible, not only in one book, but in four books. All four books have this in their story of Jesus. And not only that, but every storyteller loves to tell the part of what happened behind the scenes. I almost think what happened behind the scenes is the main purpose of telling the story, except it can't possibly be. All the gospel writers tell a variation. There's little different details. We studied them in Bible study a couple of Wednesdays ago. Little details that are different. And all of them, however, present this one set of facts, as we lawyers call it. One set of facts. One big problem. A, there's five to 10,000 people. B, there's no food. And C, Jesus wants the disciples to give them food. Have you ever felt like that in your life or in the church? (laughs) I certainly have. What are we going to do with what little we have? What is going to happen? So then the writers go behind the scenes. Probably my favorite part. There's just a few loaves of bread. There's just two little fish. How shocked do you think the disciples were when Jesus said we're going to feed? Okay, close your eyes and imagine what five to 10,000 people looks like. Imagine their shock when Jesus says, this is what we're going to do it with. They are skeptical. They are dismissive. In two or three of the other versions, the disciples say, just send them off to find food themselves. They can go get their own food. What are we here for? We're not cooks. We're teachers. We're healers. But as every gospel writer tells it, Jesus feeds them all. And to make the point even more strongly, especially in John's gospel, there is all this food left over. In John's gospel, he says, we're not going to leave anything here. We're going to pass it all out, just like you're going to be invited to take home leftovers from here and maybe eat another night or two. I shouldn't have said that without asking. (laughs) Among the four gospels, there are A couple of other variations, and the most intriguing one in John's gospel is this. There's a little boy. There's a boy. John's gospel is the only one that tells about the boy. He's the boy that has the fish and the bread. Well, I chose this story for our church birthday, kind of for obvious reasons. Early in the planning process, we decided we'd have a picnic And after a very short debate of less than two minutes, we said we're going to do it indoors because it would be June 25th. We've all come from different places to, we can imagine this is the side of the hillside. We've heard the word of God, and after the benediction, we're going to transform this into the hillside of the shared food. Now, early in the planning process, we also wondered what would be enough Even yesterday we wondered, didn't we? Is this going to be enough? Too little? Too much? (laughs) So, if you've been a part of planning today's feast, of giving your opinion to those planning today's feast, um, or setting this up, please raise your hand. All right, I know more of you gave your opinion because I heard it. (laughs) We thank you. Then as I looked at the scripture and dug deeper, it struck me how much of the 25 years of church life is lived behind the scenes, like we went to see of what the disciples were doing. Behind the scenes. Sometimes we think of church as what happens on this hour, on Sunday morning. You ever visited another church? I have. Everyone has, right? And you go to see what that church is like, and you go for one hour on Sunday morning. And you say, well, that church is like that. I think that's what that church is like. No. Church life is mainly behind the scenes. 
And that's exactly how this church began its life. More than five years before 1992, the date on the banner, 1992, 25 years ago, more than five years before that, the region of Presbyterian churches called the Presbytery of St. Augustine, it is not headquartered in St. Augustine, that's just the name, began to dream of this church. So what does that involve? There were about 63 churches at that time in the region. There are about 58 now. And that means that, for example, people from every other church or many of the other church came together and started planning this church. Money that was raised from other churches purchased the property and began to pay the first year's salary for the organizing pastor. So in the Presbyterian system, This is how it works. Behind the scenes, people start planning a new church, and that's exactly what happened here. When the church was chartered on the day, which was actually June 14th, 1992, with the approximately 100 members, plans had already been started for building this building. And so it was already the dream of the Presbytery and the people of this church to build where we're sitting now. And isn't this a great multi-purpose building. I just love it, and I love it even more in the last year when we've gotten these pews all set up on this beautiful floor. It's just really neat. This building has has stood the test of time. Many of you have told me about the exciting days of starting out, Um, how the name was chosen, which I won't go into right now, what it was like to do a lot of work around the property, what it was like to um, invite friends here, Behind the scenes is still where ministry is done in this church and in any church that's doing ministry for Jesus. So behind the scenes, um, dinner gets set up for Wednesday night. Did you know that many people here have driven other people to doctor's appointments behind the scenes or to other appointments or have come to help them move from one house to an apartment or from another house to another house, right? Right? Behind the, ske- the scenes, scouts meet here. On You may not see it if you're here on Sunday morning, but they meet here two nights a week. Behind the scenes, a preschool was started, dreamed of, and became full of life. And next year, 60 families are going to be served. This is our main children's ministry, is this preschool, and I could not be prouder to be the chaplain of that group. Behind the scenes, Bible study happens not only in church, but at people's houses. And speaking of behind the scenes, the Youth Sunday. Who came to the Youth Sunday a couple weeks ago? Did you know that lots of work went into preparing the sets, practicing, and making the gospel come alive for us that morning? Did the gospel come alive? Amen. Behind the scenes, we coordinated opening the church to our sister church and have enjoyed so much um, sharing this space with Nueva Esperanza. Behind the scenes, golf tournaments get planned, right? Behind the scenes, people drink beer at the golf tournaments? No, after the golf tournament. Letters are put on the sign out front. Money's counted after the offering is taken after church. I could go on and on, but you get the idea. Almost all of church life happens behind the scenes. And so I'm wondering as I'm speaking, where is God stirring your heart to explore some new place that you haven't been behind the scenes, to be involved in something new, or to even ask someone to find out what that might be for you? And at all the times... Wherever we are, whether the church is in the community doing work, whether it's at someone's house, whether it's in a session meeting, Jesus is with us. Jesus is with us, just like with the crowd on the hillside. We know that the Spirit of God brings Jesus to us, really to us, and living to us wherever we are. Today's scripture shows us that When people listen to Jesus behind the scenes, ministry happens. When Jesus listens, when we listen to Jesus behind the scenes, that's when ministry happens. That's where Jesus talks us out of our little thinking and makes us aware of people's needs. 
Now remember I said in the gospel includes one main detail in John that isn't in the others, and that is the little boy, the little boy with the fish. The little boy with the fish in some telling of the story, and I've heard a sermon where the little boy became the hero. If the little boy hadn't been there, no one would have eaten. If we don't pass out the food for Jesus, no one's going to eat. But there's a caution there, and that is that that's not primarily the point of the story. The point is not primarily what the disciples do. In fact, the story takes great pains to show the disciples don't know what to do. The great point of the story is that Jesus knows what to do. And that behind the scenes, there's a lot bigger behind the scenes. And it encompasses the whole world and the universe beyond it. And that behind the scenes, it's that power that multiplied the fish and the loaves. And it's that power that will lead this church to whatever ministry God wants it to do in the next 25 years. And that is already being planned by God. The hard thing is to listen and believe. When it's not something you thought is the way things work, but that God has in mind. The gospel writer John tells us bluntly that Philip didn't know what to do. There's going to be a lot of times we don't know what to do. But I ask that you all stay in touch, stay plugged in, invite friends. It costs nothing except being present and being willing to cheer. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.